uh, to support the commission's uh, outreach to the public on our, our uh, updated quality reporting initiatives. Uh, MPT has been used by a number of different state agencies with uh, uh, a good deal of success over the last uh, several years, including the uh, governor's opioid uh, command center, the Maryland Department of Health itself, and the Maryland uh, Health Benefit Exchange. So we think uh, working with a fellow state agency, if you will, will offer us some cost savings uh, as well as a streamlined uh, contracting a framework. We use what are called interagency yeah. agreements to formalize the, uh, the, the uh, engagement with this organization. We'll keep you posted uh, as we go forward. Uh, and uh, at a later meeting this fall, we'll outline the plans for using- um, I don't want to with my name. Oh, I just want to know, is there, what, so, if any option do I have? So, Richard, Richard, I think you're online. Uh, you need to mute yourself. <laughs> so uh, we also, uh, I was going to briefly update the commission on the vaccines. I think what given uh, where we are in the meeting, uh, we will have a presentation <coughs> and I'll, I'll uh, participate at that point when Julie Deppe presents because I know there's considerable interest in what expanded role the healthcare commission could play in, in engaging the public and getting the flu vaccine as well as the COVID-19 uh, vaccine when it becomes available. So happy to take any questions and you know, my sincere apologies for the disruptions uh, earlier today. Questions for Ben, anyone? Hearing none, uh, the... Uh, before we consider uh, action items today, I want to remind commissioners that if they wish to recuse themselves on any action item, they should inform the chair. Since this is a remote meeting and a commissioner can't move to the small conference room, commissioners who are recused should remain silent and mute their phones, please. Uh, on to agenda item number three, where I will recuse myself uh, and Vice Chair Sargent will chair this action. Randy? Thank you, Chair Pollock. So uh, starting in on agenda item number three, I believe we should take take the roll. Uh, I don't have the roll in front of me, though. Um, I don't know, Ben, do you have the roll? So we can call yes. the, list, the whole list of commissioners. I will forget some folks. <laughs> yes, uh, Dr. A. Kandate. Are you present? Dr. Bandari? Present. Dr. Commissioner Boyer? You can see you, Commissioner Boyer, so I... Commissioner Boyle? Present. Dr. Brumbot? Present. Commissioner Dorden? Present. Commissioner McCarthy. Present. Commissioner Metz. Yes, I'm here. Dr. O'Connor. <clears throat> Dr. O'Grady. Present. Commissioner Reimer. Here. Dr. Thomas. Commissioner Wang. Here. Thank you. I think we have enough commissioners for a quorum then. This is how I yes. read that. So we are good. We are good yes. to go. I'll proceed with action item number three. Ask everyone on the meeting. And just for all those who are not participating in the meeting and haven't hit mute yet, we can see you when you talk. A little yellow box in your name pops up right at the top. So you might want to review that mute button if you're not talking. Agenda item number three is the University of Maryland Midtown Surgery Center LLC. It's a proposed, the University of Maryland Midtown Surgery Center LLC proposes to establish an ambulatory surgery facility with three operating rooms and two procedure rooms 
in an ambulatory care building on the Midtown Medical Center campus as part of a plan to shift outpatient cases to a lower cost setting <laughs> and advance the clinical integration of the University of Maryland at downtown and Midtown hospitals. Program manager William Chan will present the staff recommendation. Mm. Mr. Chan, uh, would, you, would you please proceed? Thank you, Commissioner Sargent, and good afternoon, Commissioners. The University of Maryland Midtown Surgery Center seeks to establish an ambulatory surgical facility with three operating rooms and two procedure rooms created by fitting out approximately 13,268 square feet of shell space on the first floor of the Midtown Ambulatory Care Building. This building is currently under construction across from the University of Maryland Medical Center Midtown Campus. The facility will be owned by the University of Maryland Midtown Health, a subsidiary of the University of Maryland Medical System, which holds a 95% ownership interest, and the University of Maryland Faculty Physicians, which owns the remaining 5%. The proposed project seeks to create a cost-effective ambulatory surgical facility that will allow lower charges for patients who are otherwise obtaining these surgical services at UMMC and UMMC Midtown. And meet the demands of insurance carriers to produce charges for surgical services by allowing performance of a higher proportion of outpatient surgery in the more cost-effective ASF setting rather than the hospital and alleviate the overutilization of the operating rooms at the UMMC campus, which the applicant states are operating in excess of full capacity, sometimes resulting in the cancellation and rescheduling of outpatient surgical cases to accommodate emergent and higher acuity surgical cases. The applicant states that the UMMC and Midtown campuses will shift appropriate outpatient surgical cases from these two hospitals to the proposed surgery center the applicant's overall strategy is to assign the right case to the right place within the UMMC care continuum. While the applicant states that the two hospitals were shipped ENT, general surgery, ophthalmology, and all orthopedic cases to the proposed surgery center, UMMC will also shift surgical cases to UMMC Midtown. While the surgery center is opening in fiscal year 2023, the applicant projects the ASF's, the ASF's three ORs will immediately operate above optimal capacity or about 95% of full capacity. The estimated total cost for the surgery center is approximately $9.3 million, which it will fund with cash from both the UMS and the University of Maryland Faculty Physicians Operations. The surgery center projects making a profit in fiscal year 2023 the first year of operation and in subsequent years of operation. The primary impact of the project is on the two hospitals affiliated with the applicant. In addition to the shift of volume to the ASF, UMMC will shift surgical cases to UMMC Midtown as part of its clinical integration strategy and to relieve the current strain on the downtown campus, which the applicant states operates in excess of full capacity. The project should not impact other existing providers in the healthcare system. The proposed surgery center will be a lower cost setting than both UMMC and UMMC Midtown. The total cost for patients will be significantly lower at the surgery center than at either UMMC or UMMC Midtown, which will mitigate financial barriers and improve financial accessibility for the local service area population. The project will have a positive impact at the two UMS hospitals by reducing the utilization at UMMC's mixed use general purpose ORs to more comfortable levels of optimal capacity as defined in the surgical services chapter. Allow UMMC to accommodate additional cases that has turned away in recent years due to insufficient OR capacity and significantly improve the utilization of the underutilized mixed use general purpose ORs at UMMC Midtown with a shift of surgical volume from UMMC. I would like to note a correction to the report on pages 18 and 19. UMMC Midtown is currently operating seven and not 10 ORs. In 2007, the commission approved a CON authorizing the construction of eight ORs with shell space for two additional ORs in the future. Midtown constructed eight ORs and shell space for two additional ORs. It is currently utilizing seven of those rooms using the eighth OR 
storage in a shell space for four post anesthesia care unit beds. In implementing this project, UMMC Midtown plans to activate the eighth OR and relinquish the shell space for the two ORs and continue to use that space for PACU beds. In closing, staff recommends that the commission issue a CON for the proposed UM Midtown Surgery Center based on staff's conclusion that the proposed project complies with applicable standards in the General Surgical Services Chapter of the State Health Plan. As demonstrated need is the most cost-effective approach, is viable, and will not have an adverse impact on either existing surgical providers or consumers in Maryland. There's, therefore, staff recommends that the Commission approve this project following two conditions. Condition one, the University of Maryland Midtown Surgery Center will provide to the public on inquiry or as required by applicable regulations or law, information concerning charges for the full range of condition of surgical services provided. And condition two, the University of Maryland Midtown Surgery Center shall provide at a minimum charity care with a value equivalent to 0.35% of its operating expenses. That concludes my presentation, but I would like to introduce several individuals representing the applicants who are on the line including from the University of Maryland Medical Center, Ms. Allison Brown, Interim President, UMMC, and President, UMMC Midtown Campus. Ms. Dana Farrakhan, Senior Vice President, Strategy, Community, and Business Development. Greg Fleischman, Vice President, Finance. James McGowan, Vice President of Perioperative and Procedure Services. Scott Tinsley Hall, Director, Strategy and System Market Intelligence. Linda Whitmore, Director of Project Development, Michael Plank, Senior Project Manager, Construction and Facilities Planning, Michael Glancy, Strategic Planning Project Manager, Susie Angeles Falconer, Director of Business Development, UMMC Midtown Campus, Wanda Walker Hodges, Director of Nursing, UMMC Midtown Campus, from the University of Maryland Faculty Physicians, Ms. Lisa Triplett, Director of Corporate Operations. From ALS Healthcare Consultant Services, Mr. Andrew Solberg, and then Councils Gallagher, Evalius, and Jones, Mr. Thomas C. Dane, and Ms. Mallory M. Regenbogen. And that's concluded to my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chan. So before we have discussion, uh, why don't we put a motion on the table? Do I have a motion to approve the application of University of Maryland Midtown Surgery Center establishment of an ambulatory surgical facility? So moved. Casey Boyer. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Boyer. Do I have a second? Second, Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Commissioner Boyle. So um, is there any discussion or any questions? Yeah, uh, yes, so uh, Dr. Bandari, I have some questions. Um, let's see, we have Boyle and Bandari. I'll go alphabetically, Commissioner Boyle, but I won't forget that you have a question. <laughs> Dr. Bandari, go ahead. So is this going to be a regulated or unregulated um, uh, ambulatory surgical center? Are you saying uh, with relationship to HSCRC for fees and rates? Yes. Is it regulated or unregulated? It's, uh, you, uh, HSCRC submitted a letter that basically stated that because this was a freestanding facility that's not attached to the University of Maryland Midtown, that would be unregulated. Good. And actually in HSCRC letter I read, uh, page number two, first paragraph, it states, a regulated infectious disease clinic will be located on floor seven and regulated diabetes and endocrinology clinic will be related on floor eight. So that's a little confusing for me. Is there some services are going to be regulated and some are unregulated? Um, do we have any alibis? I mean, I, I know we're in- Bill, so this is uh, Mallory Regenbogen. I'm happy to answer that if you'd like. Um, well, wow. Yeah, uh, what, one have, second. If one second, whoever's talking, we can hear about the discussion about your alibis. Can you please mute your phone? Yes, could everybody please mute if you're not speaking? Please be sure to mute your phone if you're not speaking. Thank you. We've had enough problems today. We should all be deeply embarrassed if we fail to mute our phones after everything we've been through. Ms. Regenbogen, I think you were going to 
to speak, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Yes, you did. Thank you. Um, yes, I was just going to address Commissioner Bandari's question about the mixture of regulated and unregulated services in the building. Um, and the answer is there will be some regulated clinics on the upper floors of the building. Um, and that's a process that the applicant has gone through um, and University of Maryland Midtown campus have gone through in, in the HSCRC under their regulations. Um, if you're going to have mixed both regulated and unregulated services in the same building, you have to seek a determination from HSCRC that they will essentially allow um, that to happen. And so that's the letter that you'll see attached to the recommended decision from the HSCRC. Um, and under their regulations, you have to have certain features in place so that it's not confusing to patients about whether the services they're seeking are regulated or unregulated. Um, for example, the signage and the entrances have to be very clear about whether the patient is entering regulated hospital space or not. Um, and so essentially the HSCRC has made that determination um, back in June that they will allow the unregulated um, ambulatory surgical center on the first floor of the building. Um, and there's gonna be very separate signage um, and entrances from that and then the regulated clinics that will be on the upper floors of the building. So if the goal is to bring the cost down, why do we have a regulated in the unregulated building? Why some of the services are regulated, some are unregulated? The regulators are more cost for the healthcare system, right? If I'm correct. That's true. And I think it's actually a, a pretty common feature that occurs these days to have ambulatory care buildings that are on a hospital campus and to have a mixture of some regulated, some unregulated services. Um, I think a lot of times it has to do with just space available. Um, and a lot of times clinics are moved uh, sort of out of the main building and can be in a adjacent building. Um, I don't know if anybody else on the line um, from UMMC, Craig, if you want to add anything to that, but I think that's a pretty common feature. I'm just going to add that the clinics that are moving into the building are maintaining their current status. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that the clinics are simply, as Mallory stated, moving from one location to another, but the clinics that will be in that building are remaining uh, with the existing stats they have from a regulated and regulated perspective. Okay, thank you so much. And second is, uh, it says the uh, University of Maryland Midtown Surgical Center shall provide a minimal charity care value equivalent to 0.35%. What is the currently they are doing uh, uh, charity care and what is the maximum they will do? And thank you for doing this all for much needed patient population in Baltimore and state of Maryland. I really appreciate what you are doing at Midtown Campus. So I can answer, Craig Fleischman, I can answer that question. Um, the current charity uh, care percent in Midtown at the hospital in general, and this is across all the entire scope of services, is about 1.6 to 1.7 percent. So um, it, it's, I, I don't know the answer to exactly what the charity care is specific to surgical services because um, we, uh, we don't break it out in that capacity, but this is a, is a lower threshold. But really, when, in terms of the extent that you said, you know, it's hard to say that because the charity that we do is based upon the applications that we receive. So each application we receive for charity care has its own set of merits in terms of whether it qualifies or doesn't qualify. So to the extent that we have patients that qualify under our charity policy and they exceed that 0.35%, then those will certainly be honored in this setting. Thank you so much. Commissioner Boyle, I think you had a question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, on page 15, you're talking about the, um, you're using an inflated rate that's common in the ASF uh, industry, but then you go on and state that um, uh, that uh, the uh, third party uh, contractually adjusted rate or as a self pay patient, patients would generally not pay the full charge, but would pay a reduced amount. Generally not pay is, uh, doesn't mean never and I'm curious whether any um, uh, patients, self-pay patients, would be required to pay the full amount, which is uh, inflated. So uh, again, this is, this is Craig answering that question. Uh, the answer to that question is, is, is no. Um, it's the, the charges are one thing. Um, the, and as you mentioned, and as you read from the application, the, the payments are on the insured side are based upon contractual uh, oh, obligations yeah. with the insurers. The, for self-pay patients, they receive, generally speaking, the same level of contractual discount that an insurance company would receive off of that set of charges. 
Well, I mean, that, that, I mean, that's good to hear, but your wording is generally not pay. And, you know, that has been an issue uh, from time to time. I'm not saying with you, I'm just saying in, in general of self-pay, having to pay the highest amount. So I'm just want to make sure that they wouldn't. Yeah, I, and I, I'm not sure how to to get, to give you that true assurance, other than the fact that that they the, the charge based um the, the contract like I said they will receive the same level of contractual discount similar one certainly similar to what the insurers were. I'm not sure how to get you comfortable per se with that, other than to say it, which is only based on what I'm, my my words at that point. Okay, well then maybe in the future change your wording from generally not pay because that's what uh, that was the red flag. I appreciate. I, I think that's fair. Uh, Fair assessment, thank you. Thank you. I think Commissioner Boyer had a question or comment. I, I just one quick comment. I wanna um, give you kudos for actually reaching out and getting com real community support, not just elected officials, but reaching out to members of the community, to the, the ministers, the planning, was the Uptown Planning Committee? And who's one more? the Charles Street Development Corporation for actually reaching out to your neighbors and making sure everybody's on board with um, what you're planning. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your comment. I have a question myself. Uh, and then if any other commissioners will after that, we, we certainly will give you a chance. My question is about the total cost of care from this change. The uncharitable person, and I'm a charitable person personally, but the uncharitable person would look at this and say that you have a budget cap. You have a bunch of operatories under the budget cap that are over capacity and you're putting an unregulated space in the same building to do the same services and move those services out from underneath of the budget cap and to charge then outside of the budget cap for those services. So while it may, the charge for any one service may be less, the overall amount of money you will collect for the total volume of services you're doing will be more. And I wanted to give you a chance to address that. Thank you for that question, um, Commissioner Sargent. And I think in the application we did um, at a very high level try and address the impact that asked about the impact of the total cost of care. And that can be something that, as you point out, um, well, it can be a little bit difficult to measure. Um, I believe that uh, University of Maryland I think Midtown and the downtown campuses are still working with HSCRC to see what, obviously as part of the application, we discussed a number of clinical integration efforts that are happening that are gonna result in large swings of volume moving from the downtown campus to the Midtown campus, as well as volumes from both hospital campuses moving to the ASF. Um, and there is essentially the applicant, um, not the applicant, but the University of Maryland Midtown and Downtown campuses are still in discussions with HSCRC about what the ultimate impact may be on those global budgets. Um, and just one point of clarification that the Midtown ASF will be in a separate building. It will be on the hospital campus of Midtown, but it will not be actually in the same building. Um, and then I will, I'll ask that Craig can maybe, uh, Craig Fleischman, if you wouldn't mind giving an update, um, if there's anything else you wanna add about um, your expectations uh, regarding the global budgets of, of the facilities um, given this project? Sure. Um, yeah, we, we continue to be very active in having conversations with the HSCRC on this and what they might do from a global budget perspective as these cases come out. Your, your, your point, um, Commissioner, is, is understood, which is that in theory, if, if there's no associated adjustment on the global budget side, um, that as you do this, it actually is more cost. There's a couple of things we, we are, like I said, in conversations with the commission about uh, about that. Those are fluid and certainly happening and engaged. But the other part of this too is uh, we do have a significant backlog of cases we haven't been able to achieve, which would uh, overall come into the anticipated to backfill some of the regulatory capacity that's generated. So with that incremental volume, it should drive down still the overall cost per case. But I understood in your question, and that's a big part of our conversation with the commission is about that backfill and then how um, how that could take into account and what they will do from a global budget perspective. But I, I do understand that. We don't have a, an exact answer, but um, we do anticipate that the overall cost will go down either through the combination of backfill or GBR adjustment. Thank you. Uh, are there any other commissioners who have a question? With that said, uh, I think we can call it to a vote. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 
Aye. There, Aye. Are there any commissioners who are opposed? The motion passes. Thank you both to the staff and to all the folks from the University of Maryland who have uh, come to talk to us today about this. Thank you very much. Vice Chair, Vice Chair Sergeant, may I make a comment? Um, to, Certainly. Uh, this is Allison Brown, president of the Midtown Campus. I want to acknowledge the um, tremendous work that was done uh, under Dr. Steffen's leadership, Paul Parker, uh, Kevin McDonald, and, and Bill Chen. Um, it's been a great working relationship, and we appreciate um, their partnership in evaluating a project like this in such a fine manner. Thank you. And to all the commissioners for your support. Thank you. Okay, with that, I think we can let Chair Pollock out of uh, recusal jail and he can rejoin us. Thank you, it's good to be back. The, um, uh, onto agenda item number four. Um, for several years, the commission has worked to encourage providers to vaccinate their employees during the annual flu season. Julie Deppi, program manager in the Center for Quality Measurement and Reporting will provide an overview of Maryland's performance in promoting healthcare worker influenza vaccination to protect the health and safety of patients and workers. Julie, please proceed. Thank you, Commissioner Pollack. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. I'm here to present a recap on healthcare worker influenza vaccination in Maryland over the past 10 years. Levon, can you advance the slide or do I do it? No, just say next slide and I'll change it okay, to the next thanks. slide. Okay, thanks. Next slide, perfect. Mm -hmm. The primary reason that Maryland tracks healthcare worker vaccination is patient safety. Vaccination protects the patients and the staff. This is especially important in long-term care facilities where the average age in Maryland is 77. The past flu season, which CDC defined as moderate, adults aged 65 and older accounted for 62% of the total deaths. The flu can be deadly for anyone, but it has a higher death rate among the elderly. Next slide, please. In July of 2006, MHCC was mandated by Maryland Senate Bill 135 to include healthcare acquired infection or HAI information on the Comparative Evaluation System Report, which at the time was referred to as the Hospital and Nursing Home Performance Evaluation Guides. In addition, the Commission was mandated to abide by the recommendations of HICPAC. HICPAC recommended including flu vac vaccination of the healthcare workers across all medical industries. In, in 2008, the Federal Department of Health and Human Services issued Healthy People 2020 which included an objective to begin measuring the flu vaccination rates of healthcare workers with a target goal of 90% of healthcare workers being vaccinated by 2020. In response, the commission, with the guidance of the HAI Advisory Committee, established a work group to focus on this topic and developed a survey instrument, definitions, standards, and guidelines. The result was the Healthcare Worker Influenza Vaccination Survey for hospitals, ambulatory surgical facilities, and nursing homes. The survey instrument was also shared with the Department of Health to survey local health departments. Next slide, please. Oh, I forgot to say that same year, the National Quality Forum released a recommended measure to collect that same information. So Maryland required mandatory reporting of flu vaccination for hospitals and ambulatory surgical facilities in the 2009-2010 flu season. Nursing homes followed the next flu season with assisted living facilities with 10 or more reporting in 2011-2012. Beginning with the 2012-13 flu season, CDC required hospitals and ambulatory surgical facilities nationwide to report healthcare worker vaccination directly through NHSN, which is the National Healthcare Safety Network. MHCC now receives the hospital vaccination information directly from NHSN. In 2018, NHSN dropped the ambulatory surgical facility vaccination measure, but the commission has always collected this information directly from the annual ASF survey that MHCC administers. 
and the 2018 survey data should be available in the upcoming weeks. So next slide, please. In the pilot year of reporting, only one third of Maryland hospitals had a mandatory <laughs> policy. By the 2013-14 flu season, the year following mandatory federal, federal reporting in NHSN, 46 out of 47 hospitals had implemented a mandatory vaccination policy. The remaining hospital didn't have a mandatory policy because their vaccination rate was always around 95%. This year in response to COVID-19, that hospital has implemented a mandatory policy. So it's harder to compare the vaccination policies for the ambulatory surgical facilities because the data is older. So currently 65% of nursing homes require their staff to receive a flu vaccine and only 43% of assisted living facilities with 10 beds or more require their staff to be vaccinated. So next slide, please. Unlike with hospitals, there is no federal requirement to report long-term care, healthcare worker vaccination to NHSN. So in 2000, the Maryland General Assembly unanimously passed into law Maryland House Bill 846, which requires specified related institutions to immunize residents against the influenza virus and pneumococcal disease and employ <laughs> the influenza virus. Specified related institutions are defined in Health General 19301. This makes Maryland one of 24 states with flu vaccination requirements for long-term care facility health care workers and one of 32 states with requirements for long-term care facility patients to be vaccinated. Specifically, Maryland Health General 18404 requires patients and healthcare workers in facilities that provide overnight nursing care to two or more patients to assess influenza vaccination status, to provide or arrange for vaccination, and get written documentation of vaccination or declination. The law provides for declinations based on medical contraindications, religious beliefs, or refusal after being informed of the health benefits and the health risks. Next slide, please. This is a visual of the improvement in vaccination rates for hospitals and ambulatory surgical facilities. The jump in vaccination rates between the 2011 and the 2012 flu season and the following flu season corresponds to the year that CDC required mandatory reporting. Vaccinations for both facility types improved rapidly and have stayed consistent. In Maryland hospitals have been a national leader in healthcare worker vaccination rates, excuse me, and have consistently reported rates at or above 96% since reporting became mandated by CMS. Next slide, please. This past flu season, nursing homes met the Healthy People 2020 goal of 90% healthcare worker vaccination. Vaccination rates for nursing homes started fairly low when reporting began. They increased quickly, but then they plateaued. Assisted living facility rates have remained consistently low with very little increase since reporting began. Next slide, please. This is a quick recap of the past flu season. Hospitals have the highest vaccination rates in Maryland that exceeds the national rate of 93%. Nursing homes also vaccinate at a rate that exceeds the national rate of 69%. Assisted living facility rates are much lower than the national average of 69%. And ambulatory surgical facility rates are historically very close to the national average of 79%. And again, we'll have the uh, ambulatory surgical facility data in a few weeks. Next slide, please. Out of the 227 nursing homes in Maryland, 147 or 65% have mandatory healthcare worker vaccination policies. 28% of nursing homes have indicated no plans to implement a policy this current flu season. This past season, 370 
three assisted living facilities with 10 or more beds were required to report. 160 of these, or 43% of these facilities have a mandatory vaccination policy. Their average vaccination rate is 71%, which is much higher than the state average of 56. Close to half of the facilities, 47%, indicated that they have no intention of implementing a mandatory vaccination policy this current flu season. Next slide, please. As an incentive for facilities to raise their healthcare worker vaccination rates, the Commission set a gold star designation for facilities with a vaccination rate of 95% or higher. This slide depicts the improvement in nursing facilities with a gold star rating. Ten years ago, when reporting began, four nursing homes in Maryland had a vaccination rate of 95% or higher. This past flu season, 116, or 51%, of nursing homes attained the gold star status. Next slide, please. Assisted living facilities don't demonstrate the same level of increase in high vaccination rates. This past season, 98, or 26%, of assisted living facilities with 10 or more beds met the gold star standard. Of these, 88 facilities had mandatory vaccination policies in place. Next slide, please. On the vaccination survey, facilities are asked why employees declined vaccination. For both nursing home and assisted living facilities, other objections and no documentation tend to be the primary reason for declination. No documentation is a large factor in low vaccination rates. It is usually attributed to employees not submitting proof of off-site vaccination, staff turnover, or facility ownership changes. New staff or ownership don't know that the flu survey is being conducted, so they don't retain paperwork or they simply can't find documentation. For instance, this past flu season, one facility with a recent change in ownership had a vaccination rate of zero because they couldn't find documentation. The previous two seasons, this same facility had met the gold star standard. Next slide, please. This is an example of the educational material from CDC that we send to facilities with low vaccination rates. Next slide, please. Hospitals, ambulatory surgical facilities, and nursing homes have all made significant improvements in their healthcare worker vaccination rates, but assisted living facilities continue to have low vaccination rates. Commission efforts to improve vaccination rates include provide all facilities the link to the CDC toolkit, which contains infographics, printable material, fact sheets, and social media tools to promote healthcare worker vaccination. We provide information to facilities on local flu clinics. We share best practices from facilities that have high vaccination rates. We target outreach to facilities with low vaccination rates by sending out mailings, um, with printed material, fact sheets, and posters to post in their employee break rooms. And that material is printed in both English and Spanish. And new this season, the CDC is partnering with two major pharmacy chains to vaccinate nursing home and assisted living healthcare workers. So the Department of Health will be using our contact list to send out information to all long-term care facilities this week. So next slide, please. And here's another example of the type of posters that we mail to facilities. This one is in Spanish. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, hospitals, ambulatory, surgical facilities, and nursing homes have all raised their rates significantly. We still need to emphasize the assisted living vaccination rates. Um, the Maryland uh, pay for performance program. Uh, they increased their vaccination threshold to 95% or higher, and the increased weight of the influenza score for the pay for pay program should help raise vaccination rates for nursing homes. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic might encourage more healthcare facilities to implement or begin providing vaccination to their staff, 
and Health General 18404. How can the commission leverage this to increase the assisted living vaccination rates in Maryland? And this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, are there questions from commissioners? I, I had one, okay. if you don't mind. Not at all. This Commissioner Sergeant. Um, I find the low assisted living vaccinates, vaccination rates outrageous. So I have two questions. I'll just ask them both and then you can relate them. First, do you have any estimate how, how many of those unvaccinated workers, it really is a paperwork snafu and they've had the vaccine versus we're counting them versus people who truly have not had the vaccine in any given year. And my second question is just, do we have any estimate of how many people have actually died because assisted living workers can't get a flu vaccine of all things last year? Because this is life and death. How many people have died because these policies won't be put in place? I don't know the answer to your second question. It's an excellent question. Um, the Department of Health does track the, um, the deaths due to the flu with the, the Maryland Flu Watch. So that is definitely something I could circle back with um, staff in that department and find out if they have any numbers. So. Yeah, it's a tough one, right? Because even yeah. if you know how many people weren't vaccinated and you know how many people had the flu, you don't know how to link those two numbers together. Oh, it would have to be some kind of statistical analysis, right. I think. But you can, I don't think you need to either to, to, to share your the indignation here a little bit. Right. Uh, I think you just need to show that the flu, that the vaccination rate is actually low. And mm -hmm. you need to, to say separately that the death rate is high. And those two things are not compatible with logic and a, uh, a, a level of responsibility for the safety of vulnerable residents that all long-term care facilities should be demonstrating. Um, and I think it's, it, you know, the, the, the challenge is the degree to which you can make it mandatory. Um, you know, the, in the hospitals here, uh, the vaccinations aren't mandatory. Um, you're, they're voluntary. If you choose not to have one, you can go find employment elsewhere. Um, but uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, I would like to see that same level of uh, voluntary uh, applied to the, uh, um, to the, assisted, the assisted living facilities and the long-term care facilities. Commissioner Metz, I believe, is on the line. And I'm, I'm interested in, in, in your comments. So, yeah. Because I know that you've, that you've faced some of the challenges that these mandates uh, create for particularly in the in the rural areas. Okay, yeah, so a, a, a number of thoughts. Um, speak a little bit to Randy's um, comments about paperwork. I, I know that our documentation process for both residents and employees for our vaccinations uh, is very good. Uh, of course, we're just one facility uh, in, in that regard. Uh, vaccination rates for our residents approach or are at 100% uh, for uh, influenza. Uh, with employees, a little more of a challenge. Uh, our facility does not have a mandatory policy, although last year we achieved 99%. Um, the challenge with, and, and our local health system does require mandatory vaccinations. The challenge in long-term care, especially more in your rural areas, is the inability to acquire staff. So um, it's tough um, to staff a lot of times anyway. Uh, our facility is very adequately staffed, but very challenging. So we modified our policy this previous year and, and in, uh, enacted an incentive as well. So we provide a free lunch free meal to everybody who vaccinates as an incentive. Um, our policy then also was modified to where if you so chose not to vaccinate for whatever reason, you would be required to wear a mask throughout flu season, uh, which was a big motivator for folks. Uh, this year we'll see, you know, because everybody's wearing a mask anyway. Uh, but uh, that's some of the challenges that, that we deal with. Um, most of what I've seen 
at the personal level is not of the religious nature or of the um, no reason. It's, t it's typically, uh, and we, we provide intense education on it. And it's, it's, it's a holdover from the old fear that the virus is causing the flu or the vaccination is causing the flu, which is not possible. Um, or they've had the shot in the past and they still get a bad case of influenza. Uh, but one of the biggest challenges I think, Andy, would be um, we don't easily replace people who just go get a job elsewhere if they don't vaccinate. Uh, so that's that's a challenge definitely in the rural communities. Um, I, I was going to note that the paper performance incentive was 80%. And I'm glad to see it go to 90% uh, to push uh, those numbers higher. Uh, but some of the changes we made in-house uh, pushed ours up to approach 100%, which was, which was great. Thank you. Thank you. Do you, when you lose people to, uh, when you, you lose people to other jobs because you require that they uh, immunize, are you losing them to other jobs in long-term care facilities? In other words, if the, if the mandate were to apply equally to long-term care facilities, would that solve part of the problem? That's a good question, Andy, and I don't know um, if it was a uh, an industry-wide mandate from the state. I think that would be better uh, because I, you know, folks would, if they feel that strongly about it, could gravitate to another long-term care uh, facility. Um, so, you know, the challenges with uh, funding in long-term care, and you know, I could go on forever uh, with the ability to pay. Um, better wages, you know, we're getting competition from your, your Walmarts now and in, in, in places like that with minimum wage in Maryland approaching uh, $15 an hour in reimbursement rates for Medicaid and Medicare, not allowing us to pay uh, you know, much more than that. Um, just, you know, for a, for a nursing assistant, obviously much more for um, professional nurses, but less for your entry level ancillary workers. So, um, but back to your question, I think that if there was industry-wide mandates, uh, it, it would help uh, take the onus off of facility owners like myself um, and remove the ability to just shift to another place maybe that doesn't require it. Other questions from commissioners? Yeah, uh, uh, Commissioner Boyle. I, I have a very basic one. Um, what's the definition of a healthcare worker? Does this also include the cleaning staff, the people who prepare the meals? Good question. Yeah, it would. It would under the definition that we follow, Commissioner Boyle. We every. I mean, we have to, we vaccinate everybody, uh, so it's not just the what you would call frontline workers or those that provide the direct health care. So our housekeepers, laundry, maintenance, activities, dietary, all are all lumped into that category to be vaccinated. But you sound like, you know, one of the, the, the gold star ones that uh, we would all, all hope everyone else would be. Um, it seems to me if we're going to be a little more proactive and look for a mandate, um, in, you know, industry-wide mandate, um, then we would want to specify, you know, all healthcare workers and, uh, you know, all employees. Yeah, because we, I mean, we, we absorb the cost. We get the vaccinations through our local pharmacy. Matter of fact, it's ironic. I, I got mine today. My, you know, my infection control nurse come in today and, you know, there's a very thorough documentation process. We screen, we do our uh, tuberculosis update at the same time. Uh, so, um, Ours is pretty thorough and our documentation is very thorough. And, and folks that are coming from other facilities or who have been vaccinated can show us proof of vaccination. But by far and away, most of our folks are vaccinated by the exact same nurse uh, in our facility. So, right. Julie, Additional what questions? is required as far as documentation? So, on our survey, we ask if we ask different types of questions regarding 
Um, do you save documentation uh, of vaccination or declination? Do you save it in the employee's file? Do you require assigned documentation for medical contraindication, religious objections, or other? Um, and there's also the check the box if there's no documentation required. So at this point, the commission has not been pushing the requirements behind 18404. So our process to answer that question is um, standardized checklist, standardized documentation, signature, not only by the employee, but the uh, infection control nurse, um, and similar documentation for uh, the tuberculosis screening. Uh, ours is documented and kept in a central location, uh, not scattered among employee files so that we can quickly pull it out and uh, prove vaccination of a, an employee. Um, similar process with, uh, with our residents with documentation uh, so that it's recorded um, in that regard also. So will it require legislative action to um, um, standardize the process a little bit more so that there isn't an, uh, the, uh, the ability to say we don't have the documentation? There, there are, without looking at it, there are significant regulation already within uh, Office of Healthcare Quality for us to maintain. I mean, it, it used to be we long-term care didn't have to have an infection control nurse. Uh, we do now. Um, so we have a practitioner that is full-time that monitors um, employee and, and resident health, uh, you know, from the infection standpoint. Uh, so there, there are some regula regulation in place, but there are no regulations or statutory mandates for um, mandatory vaccinations at, at this point that I'm aware of. Um, this is Commissioner O'Grady. Um, I was just wondering in terms of this, when I think about some of the work we do on the website for consumer information, especially back to assisted living, do we have sort of an assisted living compare or something along those lines where this information could be, I mean, before we start talking mandates, something where we could publish this. So I, I tend to think of assisted living as a little bit more, you know, people are also sort of shopping for that, that apartment for that next chapter of their life. Uh, something where there's a, a little bit more of a consumer, where there'd be a strong disincentive if you ran an assisted living thing, uh, to have kind of negative um, or, or very low uh, bottom quartile or whatever uh, vaccination rates, where there's something that we could do on our own website using this data to inform consumers? The consumer guide to long-term care does have that information. So we post uh, a three-year look back. So currently it would be this current, this past season 2019-20 and then two years prior. So um, when we have the new quality reports design, we actually will be able to do a compare feature that the old consumer guide, you can't really compare, you know, side-by-side -side facilities. But with the new quality reports, a consumer would be able to compare up to five facilities side by side on one screen. So that the they would be able to see the vaccinations. Yes, you would good. be able to Very see good. the vaccination rate. So one one comment on assisted living and and uh, I'm just entering that field um, from a personal perspective with some ownership. Um, if you compare it. Not, you're not comparing apples to apples when you're talking about assisted living and long-term care. So your long-term care facilities, 227 in Maryland, uh, obviously very heavily regulated, um, all surveyed at least annually, um, and uh, very controlled environment. So your vaccination rates by default are going to be higher and monitored more closely. The majority of your assisted living facilities in Maryland, and there's some you know, 1,200 um, are less than 10 beds. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're tiny. Uh, they're your really super small mom and pop. So for instance, 
my nursing facility is kind of referred to as a mom and pop because it's only 66 beds and, and we're not part of a larger corporate chain. Um, assisted living, you know, there's, there's, you know, hundreds all the way up into thousand of very small facilities, 75 some percent that are, that are tiny. Um, and the regulatory mechanism it w would be almost impossible. It's not, it's, I mean, it's almost impossible to more thoroughly monitor what goes on uh, just with the, those very small assisted living facilities. Um, the, other, the other thing would be, quite frankly, could be very well ac access to vaccinations at those types of facilities. Uh, in in long-term care, you're dealing with ready access to institutional pharmacy providers that provide the, the vaccinations we need for both our residents and our employees. At those tiny mom and pops that are basically within people's homes uh, become much more difficult uh, to, to make occur, if, if that makes sense. That's what's so exciting about this new CMS or CDC initiative that the Department of Health is reaching out to all of the long-term care and assisted living facilities. And I don't know all the details because they haven't released it yet, but it sounds like the they're offering the flu vaccine and they might be covering the cost. And that's significant because when we work with, as you, we call them the mom and pop facilities too, the ones with fewer beds and cost is an issue that um, that's one of the reasons why we actually provide the links to local flu clinics. Like for instance, this weekend, Baltimore County is having a free flu clinic. So that's something that we would provide to the facilities in case they can't afford the cost of vaccination, that they can at least encourage their employees to get vaccinated. Right. Um, just one follow-up on that, Jeff. In terms of, is this one of the, you know, certainly in other areas, when you look at like, um, oxygen suppliers and we see that there's lots of providers and many of them are mom and pop but there are fairly large kind of more corporate entities that really cover many more people so there, there may be 300 providers or whatever and 80 percent of them are less than 10 but the the rest of them is really where the volume is so in in, in my part of the state the, you know assisted living is run by marriott or hyatt and it's six stories high and is 300 apartment units with various, you know, kind of ways of swinging in and out various skilled medical staff. So those people, it's a, it's a, it's a different dynamic and, and where you might want to have a, I don't know, a hardship policy or something else or additional sort of things like Julie is talking about for the mom and pops. I hesitate to give a free ride to all those fairly well-established, well-organized uh, big operators who this seems as, you know, the chair has pointed out, this seems kind of outrageous that they just sort of seem to blow this off as not really their responsibility when there's so many vulnerable people that they're serving. So, Correct. I, I'd rather have a, a general policy that focuses on picking up the largest number of people and then make special exceptions for the people you don't want to inadvertently step on their toes. Um, rather than leave it kind of with a lack of policy direction because you're concerned that there are mom and pops who you could step on their toes. Nobody's looking to hurt their business. But I, I think we have to, you know, we also have a responsibility to, to thinking about the patients and the consumers who, who go into assisted living facilities, assuming that they have a higher level of, of health safety given they've made this move. Correct. I mean, your, your analysis is correct. So like from my own experience, and we're just about to, to open it, I'm, I'm opening next to our adjacent to our nursing facility, a 16 bed uh, memory care assisted living facility. Uh, and it, it will be treated just like our skilled facility as far as infection control. Uh, your larger providers, like you talked about, uh, you know, your, your Marriott's or whoever your your, your big folks are like, like Brightview and, and, and some of those uh, place, uh, places that they'll have some, some flu clinics uh, and, and is billed by, you know, for their residents by the insurances and the Medicare, et cetera. 
So they have a little bit of an advantage. So, but to your point, there should be no reason that you were, for lack of a better term, corporate operators to, to uh, bypass this process. So I don't know if Julie has information that would be, that would break down the statistics between your, you know, your operators of, you know, 20 beds or more that are, that are, are more positioned through and affiliated with your chains or your corporate operators like ours will be to make sure that they're providing um, necessary vaccinations. I don't know, Julie, do you guys have that ability? Yes, we do. We have that in our data files, the corporate ownership and the bed size. We have how many employees each facility has. So we can absolutely funnel down and get down to the details. So, so then it would be possible for those types of providers and, and uh, to, there could be a mechanism in place regulatory or otherwise that would say if you're above X number of beds, you know, that, that it's mandatory or it, it's required uh, that I don't want to say would exempt and I don't want anybody to get the impression that, that the people living in your uh, eight bed facilities or your four bed facilities in somebody's home are less important, but the larger operators certainly are easier to regulate because they're affiliated with companies that should be doing it anyway. Other comments? Commissioner, um, I'd like to have one question. Um, yep. For, for um, Julie, do we get any uh, information from the department on flu death by facility? Uh, it's now, I think, well known that the uh, department publishes COVID-19 deaths by facility. Does the department publish deaths attributed to flu historically by uh, nursing home or assisted living? I am not aware that they have ever published that inf information by facility. That I would have to look into that, Ben. Thank you. Good question. Right. Thank you, Julie. That was a, an outstanding presentation and a great discussion. Thank you very much. All right. Um, next up, uh, agenda item number five, the overview of staff's plan to modernize the data release regulations governing the medical care database and other sensitive data. So the Center for Analysis and Information Systems has been working to improve its data release processes found in regulations currently in COMAR 1025-12 and 1025-6. Objectives of the changes include the expansion of data sets available to persons requesting data and improvement of the application package and approval process. Commission staff, along with our uh, AGs, have completed a first draft of the revisions to the regulations. Staff will now begin a collaborative discussion regarding updates to the process with the assistance of a work group formed of various stakeholders. Uh, Malit Nagatu, Chief of APCD Public Reporting and Data Release, will provide an overview to update commissioners about the work done so far and the next steps. Mahi, please proceed. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman Pollock. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, this presentation is to provide the plan and the work done by the Center for Analysis and Information Systems to modernize the data release capabilities of the Commission. Can go to the next slide. Thank you. Just to give you a high-level background, MHCC have been releasing the uh, MCDB data, which is the Maryland Medical Care Database, uh, since 2001 in different capacities to other state uh, government entities like HSCRC and the Maryland Insurance Association, MIA, and for uh, research institutes like the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins University. Uh, with the maturation of the MCDB data, it was compelling and timely to work on expanding the use of the data beyond what was currently being done. To that end, in 2017, MECC partnered with uh, Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health to test the utility of the data for further research use. 
the experience from the various use cases served as a foundation to plan out the approach for the modernization of the process. In terms of approach, um, uh, which I'll go over in detail in the next few slides, first we assessed and evaluated the current state uh, or what, what we call the reason for change and scoped out uh, where we wanted the future state to be based on the understanding of the benefits and practical implementation. This required identifying interventions and techniques for the transition or uh, the change process. Like this. Some of the major reasons for change uh, for the current state were things like the requirement of an RIV for all types of requests, all types of applications, basically, which subsequently meant only research organizations were eligible. In other words, applicants uh, that want to do price transparency initiatives were not qualified. Uh, at the time, only full year of the MCDS data uh, is, is made available for release. Uh, even though MACC collects other sensitive data, such as trauma patients and uh, Medicare uh, MDS, which is the data set, the current regulation only applies for uh, to the MCDB data only. In addition, the application forms, review guidelines, and approval standards were unclear as the regulation was a bit outdated and somewhat vague. Um, the plan also included updating the current website, housing the data release information to make it more intuitive and easy to access. Next slide, please. So um, based on the current state, the areas of improvement could broadly be, be classified into, two, into four buckets. So this is updating the uh, COMARS, uh, that's COMAR 1025.06 and 1025.11, developing a new application package, streamlining the application review process and documentation and improving the website. Next slide, please. The future state as we envisioned it will include an expanded use of the APC data, which is the MCTV data through the expanded data release process. Uh, also offering uh, uh, various data types, which is standard, limited, and custom data set with the capability of linking other data sources, uh, and also expanding the list of eligible organizations that could apply for the data, including individuals, governments, and entities. Um, and the other section is also uh, included developing an, a comprehensive application application package that asks for a data management plan and also provide a data user agreement template so that the applicant will understand the kind of uh, security safeguards they need to have in place. So the application in the uh, package is currently deployed and has been used for the last couple of months. Um, and um, th just to this as part of this uh, enhancement process. Um, the plan also includes to better align the review standards of Medicaid uh, 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 data with the privately insured component of the NCD. Um, and also the biggest goal is to add transparency and a, have a thorough and efficient review process. And lastly, uh, updating the website with these information so that um, there is more, it's more robust in terms of who can apply and the cost associated with the data, accessing the data. Next slide, please. So why are we doing this? So what is the long-term goal and the wider benefit? So this is uh, to execute the mission of the commission, fulfill the vision, and also meet the uh, 2022 strategic goal, which is to make MACC a trusted source of quality. Okay. So what are we doing? I am working. We have someone uh, needs to mute their phone. Go ahead, Mai. All right. So in order to specifically identify what we needed to do, we looked at uh, six other states. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we looked at six other state APCDs to identify the gaps and opportunities for improvement. 
I will not go through each of the domains, uh, since, but since there is a lot of qualitative analysis behind each of these domains, I'll just use the, this color coding just for viewing purposes. So green depict, depicts uh, good and uh, red obviously uh, shows a room for improvement. Overall, we looked at the presence of standard data release committee or advisory in charge of the process. Uh, as you can see, um, uh, Maryland is at the end of the, the last column. Uh, we looked at types of data that other APCDs make available, who can request in the presence of like uh, different kinds of application, depending on the type of applicant. Next slide, please. Mike, can I ask you a question? How did you pick these, pick these six states? How, how did we pick? Yeah, on what basis? So, yes. um, so we looked at APCDs. So um, nationally speaking, there are a handful of APCDs, right? So we looked at these APCDs that we picked are somewhat uh, in similar status as MACC. Um, so uh, and are also mature in terms of um, uh, their work, meaning have been established for at least for the last three or five years and have the experience working with data release process. Um, so that's how we picked uh, the, these states, specific states. But overall, there are uh, almost 18 of them, but most of them are only uh, on voluntary basis or are just starting um, data collection. So they weren't a good candidate for our comparison. So we looked at those that have been around for a long period of time and are currently doing uh, performing uh, data releases. Thank you. Great question. Um, so yeah, so this is just a continuation of the previous slide, just showing the different domains um, that we compared. And uh, these are a few additional ones. So we looked at the most current data available and overall uh, post data rec receipt, what the monitoring process is. So, and also we looked at their fee structure and then uh, their, their, how their website is set up. So based on that experience, uh, uh, the gap analysis we identified, uh, next slide please. Thanks. Uh, based on the gap analysis, we identified uh, the best, um, best ideas and processes that we could adapt and areas of, um, of improvement. So, um, these could be broadly classified into two and mainly the uh, uh, developing a robust application package and application process and um, basically advancement of the re review process and critical update to the, uh, to the regulation. So uh, to that end, we, um, meaning commission staff with the, our assistant attorney completed the first draft of the revised regulation and also are currently uh, form in the process of forming a data release work group uh, with various stakeholders to gain their insight and valuable feedback on the, on the revision to the regs. Next slide, please. So the, just to give you a high level uh, recap of the, what the revision will consist, it will have um, the type of data that is going to be offered it is expanded a little more expanded as I previously mentioned. It identifies a separate request and review process for government entities. Uh, it also requires non-government applicants to demonstrate that their research and to or uh, project topic uh, aligns with the public interest. Uh, we also have a new fee structure um, and also improve the transparency of the data request and data release process. Next slide, please. So as in terms of next step, um, as I mentioned earlier, we are, uh, the work group is, is being formed and also uh, we, are, um, we are kind of finalizing the, uh, the participant list and it consists of state agencies, uh, providers, uh, consumers, payers, uh, and researchers as they are the primary beneficiaries of this. And staff also welcomes commission's uh, participation as well. The work group is scheduled to meet uh, at least three times. And uh, after the final work group meeting, staff will post the draft regulation for 
public comment. And uh, finally, um, staff uh, will be presenting the proposed final regulation to MACC um, early 2021. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for your time. I welcome any questions. This is Commissioner O'Grady. I had one question on your gap analysis, and perhaps I'm just misinterpreting what's going on. Um, there's a line there on, on the first of the slides that talks about de-identification de of, the, of the data. And um, it, it seems to say that Maryland is not de-identifying data. So, um, so, yeah, so the types of, so you're not looking at just for others to be on the same page. This is slide seven and under types of data provided. It uh, says uh, de-identified data sets. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what it says there is that whether uh, the entities, the um, APCD, other APCD entities provide a de-identified data set uh, as part of their um, of various data they offer through their data release process. It's just to say that that is one of the um, types of data that they make available. So for instance, Maine um, provides the identified data set, limited the identified data set for specific projects um, uh, through for specific projects and for specific applicants. So that's why you see Colorado, Maine, uh, New Hampshire and Oregon as green, which means they make the identified data set available. And then currently Massachusetts, Utah and Maryland doesn't provide data. Data. But really, any of the data we provide, you you shouldn't be able to identify the parent, the, the patient. So aren't they all, all at some level de-identified? They're all de-identified, yes. Okay, okay. So, um, so for instance, for fully identified data sets, if you see like on uh, Massachusetts, um, there are there are specific uh, projects that they would allow entities to receive. Um, a minimum re-identifiable data. So that is one type of data set they make available. Okay. So just a, just a point here, maybe to clarify this, so that the APCD in Maryland, which is pretty typical of APCDs everywhere, is that patient name and patient say, social security number or uh, unencrypted plan number are not collected. Uh, that's typical, but not absolutely the rule. Maryland uh, does, uh, as part of the collection process, allow for the database assembler to work with CRISP to assign a encrypted master patient index generated by the Health Information Exchange that if needed uh, by other state agency partners could be used to link back with other data sets, which would not make the APCD in that case completely identifiable, but move it along the continuum uh, to some extent. So uh, as part of this process of, of looking at our standards, we would be working with the work group to determine if under certain circumstances, would we provide that same sort of opportunity to research organizations uh, or others uh, that wanted to conduct the same sort of research. We did encounter a situation last about two, two years ago in which Hopkins came to us and wanted to uh, obtain a copy of the APCD with the master patient index included so it could link with clinical information that it, uh, it held to examine uh, opioid overdose and deaths. Ultimately, uh, we uh, were not able to accommodate them because of our existing regs. But through this process, we will want a work group to, to consider whether yeah, that I don't know how to minimize it so I can look at other parts of my computer. Would if someone's got a hotline, uh, please uh, mute. 
Tracy De Shields, can you mute your line, please? Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, I think, yep, so uh, the chart, the, the, the gap analysis does demonstrate that you know, we are kind of very, we have up to this point provided a limited um, flexibility in the types of data that could be made available. And the recipients of this data are quite limited relative to what other states are doing um, with their APCDs. Uh, we'll look for the work group and ultimately the, condition, the commission to provide some guidance on perhaps broadening it. Another you know, clear example is uh, price, price transparency initiatives. Uh, many of these entities, uh, strictly speaking, are not research organizations, and we have not been able to accommodate uh, those uh, organizations' requests up to this point. Just, just to add to that, um, uh, thank you, Ben. Um, when we say, um, when we release, or when there is a request for uh, an identified uh, data, Working with CREST would allow us to ensure that the encrypted ID is going to be used, but really not re-identifying a patient because it's already a, cross, um, a mapping, we can consider it as an, an ID that could cross walk across multiple entities. So it's not really re-identifying a patient, but just linking patients. So with the new update to the regulation, we'll, be, we'll have the capability of uh, entertaining projects, similar projects that Jen, uh, Ben went over um, with the scenario, but in the past that wasn't, we didn't have that capability, but that requires working closely with CRISP as well uh, to accomplish that uh, crosswalk ID for different data sources. Okay. Oh, the regulations are, are, are approved um, and that's why it's important to get feedback. And just one other quick follow-up. I was just wondering whether you dealt, uh, you you talked to, the, you, you've done a nice gap analysis with the other states. Have you have you talked to the feds? Because most of their work, even the CDC work in this area is actually done in Maryland. Um, as well, CMS and CDC sort of have the two kind of leading sort of, of, of methodologies and whatnot of, of how to do just what you, you talked about, Ben. How do you share and allow people to link but ensure that it doesn't, that there's no way to unscramble those IDs and figure out who it is that you're talking about. And I just didn't know whether you guys looked at the, what the feds do in this same area. So um, just just when we came up with the, so when we came up with the data types provided, we looked at what CMS is currently doing as well. So this, so when we say, limited data set, it's based on the definition provided by CMS. So those are the comparisons that we were able to do. But then when we talk about in general, when we talk about the MCDV data, it includes both the um, privately insured and the public payers, the Medicaid and Medicare. However, for Medicare data, the application would be different because since we are a state DOA, um, the type of applications that we could entertain is very narrow. So it is going to be specific to projects that are only tied to the state or either indirectly sponsored by the state. So those okay. are the requirements by, uh, by the- Right, ICMS. my thinking was more just in methodological where some of this, especially with the National Center for Health Statistics is linking where you actually have clinical data going with survey data. And some of, the, some of the, just the challenges that we're talking about in, in Ben's kind of example about what, you know, what Hopkins asked for and that we couldn't accommodate. It seems to me it's, it would be nice if we could accommodate Hopkins. It would also be nice if the state had the capability to do a similar thing in some areas like the diabetes work that the state is involved in. That, uh, uh, you Brady, you raise a good point. Uh, and if you had some suggestions on uh, uh, any federal uh, officials uh, that we could reach out to, that would be very helpful. Uh, I think adding them to the work group might be a way to uh, socialize us to what some of the federal agencies are thinking. And uh, my gosh, we don't have to play, uh, pay for travel time these days. Right. <laughs> so perhaps we can uh, get them to come to 
Uh, yeah, right. They're in College Park, so I think it's pretty, you know, in the, the, the CDC people are just in College Park, so it's pretty easy, even if we don't have to pay for travel, if we did. Thank you. Yeah. I feel like I think the technical part might not be the biggest challenge, more of the regulation and the, um, this, um, the process that we have in place, but te technically, I don't think that will be a big issue. Um, Other questions for Mahi? Great, thank you, Mahi, that was fantastic. Um, ben, would you like to share the upcoming activities for the November public meeting? Uh, so uh, first off, uh, again, my apologies for the disruptive meeting today. We'll, we'll be looking at the uh, arrangements for uh, future meetings. Uh, I think that we, we have always erred on making our uh, meetings as open uh, as possible, but uh, there are challenges with that, and we'll look at appropriately balancing uh, those uh, those two requirements. I did want to mention just uh, at the outset before I uh, dropped into what we would be doing next week month is that on the vac on the flu vaccine front, we have already reached out to the department in terms of whether. Uh, they would consider uh, modifying uh, the section of the statute pertaining to mandated flu vaccinations of 18404. Uh, it had been tried uh, in 2015. That was uh, then. Uh, and I think this, obviously the climate is much different. Uh, they have not responded uh, either affirmatively uh, or negatively on this, uh, it should be noted that in the pu public health emergency, the secretary could accomplish this objective by via a uh, an order, uh, but that would remain in effect for only the duration of the public health emergency. So we will be working with them. Uh, they have not uh, signaled to us whether they would uh, support a legislation coming from the Healthcare Commission uh, either to do that very same thing. But we clearly want to work uh, closely with them as well as the uh, post-acute community to figure out how I think we can move this forward as the broader objective of expanding you know, our, uh, flu vaccinations uh, in line with also the likely rollout in the six months of uh, vaccinations for COVID-19. Uh, for November, I, I have already uh, indicated that we commission will be uh, holding a commissioner retreat. Uh, currently, the plan is to do that over two uh, half day sessions. Uh, pr probably in the afternoon, we will uh, be sending that communication out to you uh, about that and we'll uh, We'll post that information on our website uh, as as we do when we have commissioner uh, uh, retreats. For the November meeting, which will be uh, the week before Thanksgiving, the uh, 17th of November, uh, we will uh, be considering the uh, several uh, certificates of ongoing uh, performance for PCI programs in the state. Uh, we don't expect we will have any uh, CONs for the first time in some time. Uh, keep in mind, however, we are now operating under the rapid turnaround rules of legislation uh, passed in 2020, or 2019, excuse me, that requires us to act uh, promptly on CON applications uh, if there's no interested parties, I believe it's uh, 60 days. Uh, and so we were operating under those uh, requirements that have so far uh, met that standard. Uh, we'll also uh, provide a update on uh, our work with the APCD. I know that in uh, September, uh, we had very early returns from 2020. I know there was, it was, uh, we weren't as clear as we might have been. I plan to ask the staff to come back and provide some additional updates. Uh, we've got some improved uh, uh, information from the payers, as well as we've worked with our private, uh, our private database contractor to uh, clear up some of the 
dramatic variations that we saw that turned out to be in actuality not as dramatic as we had feared. Uh, and I'll clarify that for the commission. Uh, and uh, lastly, I would expect that on telehealth and on the Maryland primary care program, we would have uh, some uh, updated information on the progress work we've made. Uh, recall that we have to, uh, that is the state has to have a proposal for track three of the Maryland primary care program to the federal government by uh, the end of this year. So uh, that's gonna have to move on a fast track. Uh, our, our role uh, to support the secretary's uh, work there is pretty key. And uh, David Sharp and his team are working very closely with PMO, project management office to come forward with a rational uh, proposal to uh, CMS that will be summarily uh, shot down. So uh, we want your input and thoughts on that. I would note that on our telehealth work group, I detected some interest on the part of Dr. Bandari. Uh, and if he and others would like to participate in the several work group meetings that are planned over the next uh, six weeks, uh, please get in touch with either David Shah or me. Uh, these meetings typically are in the later afternoon. Uh, if it's convenient for other commissioners that would like to join the, the community, the conversations are pretty, uh, pretty insightful of where different provider organizations and payers stand on uh, how we move forward uh, with telehealth uh, as we move hopefully through the, uh, through the pandemic and back into a more normal standard of care. So, that's uh, it. Expect an email shortly from the, uh, either from um, Ms. Stevens or from me on the plans for the retreat. Thank you, Mr. Stephan. I would love to do that. Uh, we'll Thank reach out to you, Dr. Bandari. Thank you, sir. Others, please feel free to contact me as well. If there are no further uh, questions or comments, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Commissioner O'Grady. Me. Second, Bandari. Seconded Commissioner Bandari. All, all opposed? Good. <laughs> See you all in a month. Thank you. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.